Um, this is a great privilege and burden to talk to you today at the end of the conference. Um, the privileges that I've gotten to listen to um, all of the presentations and learn a lot of things and have lots of new ideas. The burden, of course, is that there's been a lot of wonderful things to say. Um, and I also know that conferences breed fatigue. So we'll get through um, after the technological glitches. Um, one thing I do want to say is that thanks again for inviting me. I'm sorry that I'm not there physically. I just had some other commitments that made traveling hard, but I am happy to join you this way. Um, in the presentation today, what I intend to do is I want to take somewhat of a meta view on gender and comparative theology and talk about a few different um, areas. The three areas that I want to talk about is the way that gender is, should be, or could be present in Islamic comparative theology. And I'm going to focus on these um, on these areas. Um, first, context, meaning the general importance of a contextually aware theology, and more specifically, the context in which comparative theology and Islamic comparative theologies are authored, received, and received, and the context to which they respond. Second, content, meaning the what of comparative theology, the topics and foci of comparative theological investigation. And third, method, meaning the how of comparative theology, the approaches and the methods that we use as constructive comparative theologians and the underlying of the assumptions of those methods. In focusing on these three areas in relation to gender, I do not aim to provide definitive answers. My goal, rather, is to prompt productive conversation about the objectives and possibilities of Islamic comparative theologies that conscientiously engage gender, not as an optional category of analysis, but as a central and ever-present concern. All right. Let us turn to the first area, context. Context is the who, where, and why questions of comparative theology. The concerns related to context are both general, which means they apply to all comparative theology, really to all theologies, and specific um, concerns that, that apply to contemporary Islamic comparative theologies. In general, context should be an explicit and acknowledged concern for all comparative theologies, Muslim and from other. I'm seeing a lot of chats. Hold on one second. Um, okay, hold on a second. Can people see my my um, my presentation? Someone I is think saying part of it is actually blurred out. There's a um, so we can't we can sort of. Okay. Oh, it's it's visible now. Yeah, it's visible now. Okay, but it's it's um it's okay. So you see a slide, and you see me, maybe at least hopefully the slide. Yep. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Okay, so let's turn to context. Okay, so as I was saying, the who, where, and the why questions. Um, in general, this should be an explicit and acknowledged concern for all comparative theologies, Muslim and from other traditions and perspectives. Context, of course, shapes the comparative theologian in terms of languages, cultures, norms, what we pay attention to, and the motivations for doing our work. Context, perhaps more accurately, con the plural, context, shapes the questions we bring to comparative theology, what we um, pay attention to, and the tools that we use. Context also shapes the accumulated traditions, the texts, the rituals, et cetera, that we engage as comparative theologians. For example, if we are engaged in comparative theology based on exegetical texts, we must grapple with the ways that those texts are products of the context and interactions among those contexts. Context is also a general concern for the communal resonance component of comparative theology. Now, this communal resonance component is one of the main goals and main methodological features of comparative theology. So context is a general concern here as well. Comparative theology is never simply an individual project, but a legible contribution to communal discourse. In every piece of this general contextual concern, gender is relevant. 
Who is the comparative theologian? Who has access to the formation, education, and sources necessary for comparative theology? Are some people excluded, included, elevated based on gender and gendered norms? Whose questions and concerns matter? What voices and perspectives are preserved in accumulated traditions? Does, for example, the privileging of written texts over ritual practices in comparative theology reflect a gendered bias? How do we define communal resonance? In this is this category gendered? Especially if authority and leadership are historically gendered. These are general questions for all comparative theologians. I'm just checking to make sure you can hear me because I'm getting, getting nervous and it will cut out. Okay, I see no chat, so yay, we're on track. Um, let me know if it's not, please. It's also worth um, pointing out that attentiveness to the context and persona of the comparative theologian is a methodological intervention of feminist theories and theologians. There is no such thing as a neutral or decontextualized standpoint. As such, the often male articulated voice cannot be assumed to be a universal norm that automatically includes all of humanity. This connects with what I'll discuss in a moment related to gendered methodology. Okay, we have a chat. Everything's very fine, thank you. Okay. Um, more specific. Oh no! Make the, sure. it, okay, sorry, I, it just disappeared it, for a minute. But I think the slide is back now. Okay. Okay, and now it has more text on it. It does. Yep. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so for so more specific for contemporary Islamic comparative theologians, gender is a contextual concern because we author comparative theologies in and for contexts in which gender is often politicized. This politicization assumes many forms, ranging from immigration policies, to public discourse, to legal statutes, to gendered symbols related to bodies and sexuality. Comparative theology is not immune to the politicization of gender. And while it manifests in innumerable ways, there are a few significant forms that I wanna draw our attention to today. First, superficial characterizations of Muslims by non-Muslims. This, for example, occurs when Muslim women and men are grouped into broad norms such as passive and violent, when intra-Muslim sexual and gender diversity is ignored, or when Muslims are presented as foils for other traditions and theologians' perspectives on sex, gender, and sexuality. Just to give an example coming out of our, my U.S. context, this is often the case, for example, with um, discussions around homosexuality. Muslims become a foil in the broader conversation that's not really about Islam or Muslims. Second, hegemonic universal feminisms. These formulations of feminism both religious and not, claim universal experience and universal objectives. While they attend to the manifestations of gender in context, content, and method, they impose universal norms, limit diversity, and sometimes assert false consciousness to people or communities that don't ascribe to those norms. Third, Intra-Muslim demonization of gender theory and feminisms as un-Islamic or foreign. This is the contemporary trend within Muslim communities to attempt to discredit gendered analysis and concerns by claiming that these are foreign transplantations into Muslim communities. Here, it is wildly significant that the dismissal of gender concerns is coupled with the reification of boundaries among religious traditions. Reification based upon specific, often exclusivistic theologies of religions. This is a vivid example of how gender is woven into the whole field and discourse of comparative theology. Why do these forms of politicized gender matter? Simply, this is the tensive and complex context into which Islamic comparative theologies are defined, articulated, and received. How do we engage in comparative theology, which requires interaction with other traditions and communities, 
if, the, if those traditions circulate superficial characterizations of Islam and Muslims? Can these be avoided? Should they be? What if our work, including our writings, our conferences, and our dialogues, inadvertently confirms these characterizations? Can one goal of Islamic comparative theology be to push back on these characterizations? If we engage gender and gender theories in our work, how do we, or do we even, grapple with hegemonic feminism? Does our work reify religious boundaries and thereby, and thereby reify notions of Islamic and un-Islamic? When deeply engaging tradition sources and attending to communal resonance, do we acknowledge the ways that calls to tradition, community, and the real Islam create internal outsiders? Does this matter? Um, to me, it matters greatly, and I will invite you to um, consider that it might matter as well. All right, let's see. Okay, so there's a new slide on. <laughs> yes? Yes. Okay. Yes? Yes. Okay, thank you. You can see my reticence. I just want to confirm we're moving. Thank you for letting me know. All right, so we can now move on to the second area in which gender is present in Islamic comparative theology. This is content. Content is the what of comparative theology, the topics and the foci of comparative theological exploration. Gender is a topic and subject of some Islamic comparative theological investigations. For example, those that focus on depictions of women in general within traditions and texts, and, um, and Dina gave us some example of that, or those that explore shared women, such as Maryam and Mary, or Hajar and Hagar in Islamic and Christian and Jewish traditions. There are so many possible gender-related foci that could be identified. Rather than list potential topics, it seems most relevant here to state that even as a content topic, gender remains underdeveloped, underexamined, and treated as secondary to the main work of Islamic comparative theologies. By the way, this is not particular to Islamic comparative theologies, as many here will know. It is a characteristic of theologies in general, but also of comparative theology in general. If this is the case though, what are some general guides for developing and emphasizing general, um, gender as a content concern? I'm gonna offer four suggestions and some of them may seem fairly simplistic, but it's necessary to make them explicit and also for us to reflect upon how we do or do not incorporate them um, or even marginalize them, um, which is the other extreme. All right. First, this is the um, most simple guide ever. Include it, and then once you're done including it, include it more. And I would encourage people here to think that, you know, gender often, you know, we compile these volumes on theology, including comparative theology, and then gender is like the one thing on the end. Why isn't gender incorporated throughout all of analysis, especially given the examples that I already gave previously about the ways that our communities deploy gender and religious otherness to create boundaries? It seems that this field cannot get away from those norms. And so how do we include it? So include it, include it more, but also think about where we are including it. Second, Gender is not just women and women related things. Now this is very obvious, but it also always needs restating. Gendered content and foci include depictions of masculinity, of sexuality, of queerness, of imagery, of language, and all, et cetera. They also include exploration of relationships, prescriptive relationships, practical relationships, descriptive, um, descriptive relationships and more among people who are gendered. Um, and newsflash is that all people are gendered um, in diverse and complicated and historical ways, but all people, we still use this category of gender. One of the best tips I can offer here is that they are, there are extremely valuable comparisons that can be made when we have a more complex understanding of gender as a category and lens of analysis. Now, I'm just going to offer one example that Klaus mentioned at the very beginning of this conference that I um, engage in my work. So in my work, I do not 
compare Maryam to the Christian Mary. Rather, I use the gendered category of purity to probe comparative intersections between Islamic discourse on Prophet Muhammad's sinlessness and illiteracy, in this context, illiteracy meaning um, being untainted by previous revelation. I compare that, that conversation with the Christian Mary's virginity. Um, I've written extensively on this and I'm happy to discuss more in um, conversation. Third, and closely related to the previous point, gendered, gender related content is not just, um, gender related content in Islamic comparative theology is not just the responsibility or specialization of women. It should not be left to female theologians alone. My experience is that this relegation is part of a broader trend of treating such work as a particular form of the real comparative theology. If gender is a category of existence that we use and embody that is involved in Muslim communities in life-giving but also very harmful ways, there can be no Islamic comparative theology that avoids this content area while simultaneously claiming to attend to real communities and real people. Lastly, context, context, context. Now I've written it three times, so that means it's important, it's important, it's important. I want to refer back to everything that I said in the first section about the context of the theologian and the accumulated context. In the realm of content, subject matter choices are always conditioned by the contemporary context or contexts. They will also be conditioned by historical contexts and the gendered realities that those contexts deliver to us today. For example, we may engage in comparative theology in relation to Aisha, or what is sometimes called the Aisha model. It's a very common move today. But do we, fo but do we following the work of someone like Ash Gessinger, for example, grapple with the contextual reality that many depictions of Aisha and the interpretation of her significance and behavior are largely preserved and authored by men in patriarchal context. Aisha is gendered in multifaceted ways. So are the institutions of knowledge and tradition surrounding her figure. Both realities are ripe for Islamic comparative theological investigation. Staying with um, the traditions around Aisha for a moment, it's also worth pointing out that many ahadith related to her are focused on drawing distinctions among groups of people, drawing social distinctions. There is so much to unpack here about the ways that female figures are used to police boundaries, inclusive of the boundaries between religious communities. Gender is tangled together with religious diversity and difference. And therefore, as Islamic comparative theologians, we will want to take that very seriously. There's even um, perhaps a clearer example of this tangling together um, in, in what we would maybe call interfaith marriage. Um, specifically, um, I'm referring to the marriage of Muslims to people from other religious communities. Legal and ethical perspectives on this reality are often differentiated by sex, as many of you will know. Um, I'm not ascribing to those, I'm just describing those. Um, they're often differentiated by sex, with Muslim men being assumed to have this privilege and Muslim women being assumed to not have it. Contemporary explanations of this difference invoke patriarchal norms and complementarian understandings of gender roles in which women can be or will be controlled by men. These prescriptions, however, are also about religious views of the religious other. And you find this out very quickly if you start digging around in the tafsir tradition and other places to look at how they ex how um, exegetes and even legal scholars have explained the rationales. They don't explain them the way we explain them today. But what they will say is you'll quickly get into a terrain where you see things like this being said. You have male religious others who are described as being domineering and therefore they cannot be married to Muslim women because they will dominate them. Female religious others who will follow Muslim men, um, they will be passive and receptive and following. 
And Muslim men who are tolerant and accepting of difference and therefore capable of being married to other religious others because they won't force or compel people to change their religious tradition. Again, there is so much to say here, but my main point is to illustrate how gender and religious otherness are often not far from each other. These four guides will help to increase gendered content exploration in Islamic comparative theologies. And increased gendered content exploration will help us to really systematize com Islamic comparative theological methods. They will bring a critical and intersectional lens to that analysis. Somebody is waiting to be admitted. <laughs> um, all right. All right. New slide check. Everything's fine. Check. Yep. Go ahead. Oh, well, wonderful. Thank you very much for confirming. All right. So the third and final gendered area that I will discuss today is method. Method is the how of comparative theology. The approaches and tools that we use as constructive comparative theologians and the underlying assumptions of these approaches and tools. In my view, methodology is one of the most exciting areas in which gender and Islamic comparative theology come together. It is a convergence that can aid us in articulating relevant and resonant theologies that draw deeply and meaningfully upon tradition while responding to diverse contemporary needs and concerns. In short, gendered methodology can lead to transformative Islamic comparative theologies. And what I mean by this is that they assist Muslim communities with what they are trying to do, with the ethical and theological and communal demands that they are trying to fulfill. So it's not a secondary project. It is something that is servicing broader goals, some of which have been discussed in this conference. I've written extensively about this gendered methodology, specifically the ways that gender theory and diverse feminist theologies extend, challenge, and enhance dominant comparative theology methods. Um, and this is mostly in the book Divine Words, um, Female Voices. And so I'm just going to highlight um, a few aspects of this expanded methodology before wrapping this up. But one thing I want to add um, before getting to those points is that a few people have mentioned it throughout the duration of this conference, and I believe that Klaus mentioned it very at the beginning as well, which is that the importance, um, not only in terms of doing good theology, but the ethical importance of being explicit in one's method cannot be understated. And so one of the things that I have written a lot about is that methodology can actually create better interactions among people because it can create standards and guides for how we're going to go about doing comparative theology. And one thing it's probably worth stating is that not all comparisons are comparative theology, right? And there are lots of things we can compare, but how do we compare? Why are we comparing? What values and commitments are we bringing to that project? We need to be explicit about that. Now, I'll say that that is also a feminist theological intervention because everybody brings commitments. Some people get to pretend like they don't bring them while bringing them, and others are, are um, described as bringing, you know, feminist or egalitarian or even liberation commitments to the project. But everyone's bringing commitments. So this call for explicit identification of methodological commitments and goals is an intervention into this methodology as well. And I think it's highly important. It doesn't have to be one method, but why are you doing it and how are you gonna do it? And then do you hold yourself to that as you go about doing it? Okay, so let me move on to these, um, these few four points. They should be on the screen right now. All right, so I'm just gonna highlight these four features of this um, expanded methodology. First, it necessitates attentiveness to power dynamics among and within traditions. Gender theories and diverse feminist theologies challenge the possibility of neutrality, and as such see avoidance of discussing power as an act of obscuration. It's not just a topic we don't have to discuss. If we don't discuss it, we are participating in its perpetuation. In the context of interreligious engagement, including comparative theology, including comparative theology, there is no equal footing or level playing ground. Our choice is not to pretend there is and then proceed with our theologizing. 
We must acknowledge power differentials and then incorporate this knowledge into our methodology. This, for example, will mean that a singular method of comparative theology will not be applicable to all acts of comparative theology or to all interlocutors. Method will need to shift or be modified depending on the traditions of theological engagement. So if we're talking about Islam to Christianity, or perhaps we're talking about Buddhism and Islam, or indigenous traditions and Islam, or Hinduism and Islam, the methodologies will shift because the power relationships in diverse contexts are different, and we cannot apply the same method to that. What does this mean for Christian dominance in the contemporary discourse of comparative theology, especially if Christianity is the dominant contextual and disciplinary tradition? if it defines the terms, what method is appropriate for a non-dominant tradition engaging a dominant one? So in my context, that would be the case for Islam and Christianity, and I think also probably in German context as well. What would be appropriate in terms of methodology for a non-dominant tradition engaging with another non-dominant tradition? There are different stakes. There should be different concerns and different methodological adjustments. Attentiveness to power dynamics requires flexibility and agility in method. Flexibility and agility will also require more interreligious knowledge and learning. And I don't mean necessarily academic knowledge. Um, we had some conversation about youth and students yesterday, and there are places where comparative theology takes place outside of the academic context. For example, if we are no longer focusing only on exegesis, then we must be knowledgeable in other areas. I argue, though, that the demand for deeper knowledge is a safeguard, is a safeguard. Um, sorry, someone's wanting to be admitted. Um, I argue, though, that the demand for deeper knowledge is the safeguard of the method that fosters responsibility and mutual accountability, thus pushing back on superficial characterizations and comparisons that challenge deep comparative theology. It creates space. It also creates space for Islamic comparative theology to define our own terms and methods and concerns, and for others then to substantially engage those definitions. Second, this method cent centers outsiders within Islamic traditions. Outsiders within is a term borrowed from Michelle Voss Roberts, um, who is a comparative theologian. It refers to those members of a community or tradition that are often decentered or relegated in traditional authority structures and sources. Now, look, I'm not, they are still members of the communities and meaningful members of communities, but they are often relegated. By explicitly centering these voices, perspectives, and sources, the method of comparative theology not only expands content possibilities, but it puts into place a methodological corrective to all three of the gendered um, con context concerns that I mentioned in relationship to Islamic comparative theology. Third, this method moves beyond written texts as the primary subject matter of comparative theology. The first two features, attentiveness to power and outsiders within, often necessitate this move. But the methodological shift here is also intentional and enriching. I'm admitting this person. Okay, somebody has been admitted. Um, this methodological shift is often um, intentional and enriching. It allows for a broader and more dynamic view of diverse Islamic traditions and Muslim communities. Moreover, it's not simply a shift away from, um, from the normative to the on the ground. It is using Islamic traditions and norms, such as the heavy emphasis on ritual practice and social ethics, or doing things, if you will. It's using those Islamic norms and traditions to reshape methods and foci. It is also challenging the dominance of other communities in defining a one-size-fits-all methods approach to comparative theology. Written texts will, though, remain important, but this new methodology will require that we are always analyzing their gendered assumptions, context, and authorship. We can't engage with them and um, without acknowledging those features. And then finally, fourth, 
This methodology transforms Islamic comparative theology into a way to move forward toward greater humanization and egalitarianism within and beyond Muslim communities. In early comparative theological method, um, following Frank Clooney and others, the main goals of comparative theology were learning from and with the other, um, generating fresh theological insights, and this communal resonance thing that I've already mentioned. A gendered lens on method does not do away with any of these goals, but in line with broader feminist theological commitments, the why of comparative theology, the reason that we do it, is not just for that. It doesn't stop there. The why, the motivation, the impetus, the drive for all of the um, learning that is necessary to do deep comparative theology comes out of the fact it's tied to concrete lived realities and a quest for greater human, a greater flourishing. And picking up on the comment from the end of the presentation, the last presentation and discussing, quest for greater flourishing, not just of the male and not just of the human, but this quest for greater flourishing in the world. And I want to conclude by saying one thing about this, and that is that not everybody will share that as the why of comparative theology, but we should be asking people to share their whys of comparative theology. And one of the motivations or justifications for why we do comparative theology is that it can transform people's lives, it can limit harm, it can create better relationships with God, if that's a category that's meaningful to you. In my other writings, I describe this as a way to engage the prophetic sunnah, a way to engage in transformative taqwa, not something we possess, but something we do and grind away at, move closer, polish ourselves, create better relationships with God and with people, and a way to move our real umam, our real communities, closer to the ethical ideals that we aspire to. And so with that, I will say um, thank you, and I'm finished, and I'm going to turn off my slides so that I would just be me on the video, and hopefully that will be less um, problematic. So thank you very much.